Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. This is the story of one of the most tragic incidents in aviation history. Of how a jumbo jet goes berserk, plunging up and down at 7,300 meters. Of how an innocent mistake made years earlier puts over 500 lives at risk. And how investigators literally stumble on the reason behind the biggest single air crash in history. Japan Airlines Flight 123 is uncontrollable. Next. may be the last video ever taken of Japan Airlines Flight 123. It's late summer and millions are traveling home for a traditional Japanese holiday. Something exploded. Japan Air 123 request. The plane is only 12 minutes into its flight when terror strikes. It's out of control, plunging up and down hundreds of meters at a time. And it's headed straight into the mountains that surround Mount Fuji, the tallest mountain in Japan. On the ground, Japan Airlines staff search frantically for the cause of the problem. In Tokyo, air traffic controllers try to guide the plane to safety, while the pilots resort to desperate measures to keep the plane aloft. Tokyo, Japan, August the 12th, 1985. In most of Japan, it's the eve of Obon, when people traditionally honor their ancestors, often returning to their place of birth for family reunions. Tokyo's Haneda Airport is crowded, with thousands trying to get home. On the tarmac, jumbo jets are lining up. Air travel is so popular here that Japan Airlines has to use 747s even for its short internal flights. Tokyo Area Control handles all aircraft over central Japan, including those on their way to and from the city's two big airports, Haneda and Narita. It's six o'clock in the evening, but the rush won't be over for hours. Crowded passenger lists and busy controllers make it a typical holiday weekend. Roger, approved as you request. Cathay 456, turn right on heading 250, climb and maintain flight level 240. At Haneda Airport, Japan Airlines Flight 123 is boarding. Among the passengers is young Yumi Ochiai. She's actually a flight attendant for Japan Airlines, but today she's off duty. Yumi takes a seat, four rows from the back of the plane. At 6.12 in the evening, flight 123 takes off heading for the industrial city of Osaka, 400 kilometers to the west. It's filled almost to capacity, 509 passengers and a crew of 15. Japan Air 123, contact Tokyo departure. Roger, Japan Air 123. Air one Captain two, Masami Takahama is 49 years old and one of the airline's senior training captains. On this flight, he'll be handling the radio and keeping an eye on the first officer, who's sitting in the captain's seat. Yutaka Sasaki is flying the plane. He's hoping for promotion to captain. Hiroshi Fukuda, a veteran flight engineer, is the third man on the flight deck. Tokyo departure, Japan Air 123, 
passing eight, uh, 800. JAL 123's route will take it south over Enshu Bay, then southwest along the coast, until finally taking a sharp right turn to land in Osaka. The flight will take 54 minutes. Flight 123 is leaving Tokyo behind, climbing to 7,300 meters. 12 minutes into this short flight, the plane's black box shows that all is going well. Hello, pet. What's the problem? Someone wants to go to the restroom. Shall I let him? The plane's black box records a routine request from a passenger. He wants to use the bathroom before the seatbelt light is turned off. Be careful, please. An ordinary request on a routine day. Air is rushing out of the cabin. The oxygen masks drop down automatically when the air pressure falls. The explosion, the sudden loss of pressure in the cabin. There must be a hole in the aircraft. Gear door. Check gear. Gear. What? Check gear. Gear. The pilot's first thought is that the landing gear doors have blown off. Squawk 77. 7700 is the emergency code. When the crew radios this code to the ground, air traffic control will know the plane is in trouble. Every plane on the controller's screen carries a label, giving the plane's identity. Suddenly, the label beneath Flight 123 changes. Someone in the cockpit has keyed in the emergency signal. The plane's crew members are baffled. They know only that there's been a loud noise, some sort of explosion, a subsequent drop in cabin pressure, and a growing loss of control. Yet their instruments offer no clues to the mystery. Engines. Oh, engines okay. Ominously, right the pilots can't right get the plane right to respond. It's dropping. Right turn. Right turn. Hydraulic pressure. It's dropping. The plane's flight controls are powered by hydraulic pressure. The elevator, which makes the plane go up and down, the rudder, and ailerons, which make it turn. On a big modern jet, all these are too heavy to operate with cables and levers. Instead, they're controlled by hydraulic fluid, which flows in pipes around the aircraft. It's the lifeblood of the plane. Tokyo, Japan Air 123, request immediate trouble. Request return back to Haneda, mover. Roger, approved as you request. Turn right to heading 090. Don't bang so much. Turn it back. It won't go back. Nothing seems to be working. All the controls are dead. They're 7,300 meters up in the air, traveling at nearly 540 kilometers an hour and unable to control the plane. In the growing uncertainty of the situation, the pilots know they need to get down fast. The controller is puzzled. Instead of making the anticipated 180 degree turn back to the airport, the plane now veers off its course, but not towards Haneda. No. No. Ah, 123. Negative. 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 Please confirm that you are declaring emergency. That's right? That's affirmative. Request the nature of your emergency. Hydraulic pressure all lost. All lost? No. Look. All lost? Yes. The company, please. Make a request to the company, please. You want to make a fuss? The crew seem paralyzed and don't radio the airline or answer the tower. The officials on the ground don't know that the plane has lost its hydraulic power, but their screens tell them it's flying erratically and is Let's possibly descend. out of control. Right turn, descend. Look at his altitude. Up and down, up and down. But now, on control. Put your hand into it or it's stop. The hydraulics failure has caused a serious problem. 
For the last few minutes, the plane has begun flying in an alarming pattern. First, it climbs steeply, then tips over and goes into a terrifying dive of 1,200 meters, only to level off and begin to climb again. This repeats itself over and over again. The pilots cannot understand this bizarre behavior, and they are powerless to stop it. Tokyo Area Control, August the 12th, 1985. The controller receives an emergency signal from a jumbo jet that left Haneda Airport 13 minutes ago. Tokyo, Japan Air, one, two, three, request immediate. Trouble. Request return back to Haneda. Mover. What the opposite in my... In the cabin, confusion and panic spread like wildfire. There's been an explosion, and now some passengers are gasping for air. Hydraulic pressure is dropped! The plane's precious hydraulic fluid is gone. That's why the flight controls aren't working properly. Don't bang so much. Turn it back. It won't go back. Airline personnel are trained to take charge in a crisis, and passenger Yumi Ochiai helps out even though off duty. At Tokyo Control, the controller is now joined by his supervisor. Jal 123, he's declared an emergency. Says it's uncontrollable. He says he wants to go back to Haneda, but his heading is all wrong. He can't seem to turn. Get him to Nagoya. That'll be the easiest. It's a straight line. The best solution would be for the plane to switch course to Nagoya Airport, which is 128 kilometers straight ahead. But they'd need to start descending immediately if they're going to land there. Right, your position 72, 72 miles to Nagoya. Can you land at Nagoya? Negative. Request back to Haneda. It's a longer runway. The captain wants to try to get back to Haneda. It's a large airport and ideally suited for a jumbo 747 in an emergency. But it's in the opposite direction. If he can get it down. Uh, 123, can you descend? Roger, but the black box shows that he doesn't descend. Without control of the aircraft, they can't. In the thin atmosphere at this altitude, the passengers are finding it difficult to breathe. People without oxygen masks may soon become unconscious. The situation worsens as some of the masks at the back of the plane run out of oxygen. It's been five minutes since the explosion, and a flight attendant is finally able to call the cockpit with news about what's happened to the plane. Yes, what is it? The flight attendant tells the engineer that the explosion has occurred in the rear of the plane and may have come from the baggage compartment. So, the baggage compartment further in the rear. Listen, right now the baggage compartment right at the back has collapsed. Uh, I think we'd better descend. They need to get down quickly before the passengers become unconscious. But the captain seems to be struck by a strange paralysis. All the passengers are using their masks. Shall we descend a little? The captain does not reply. It's possible that by now he and his crew are suffering from hypoxia or lack of oxygen to the brain. The R5 pet? At this altitude, the oxygen in their blood starts to fall. First, their judgment may become impaired. Eventually, they may lose consciousness. The R5 pet? Yes, I understand. Captain, the R5 massive, stop! At the R5 door, the situation is becoming critical. The oxygen supply has failed. The cabin crew have to give the passengers whiffs of oxygen from a gas bottle. Still, the captain and his crew seem to be drowning in confusion. I think we better make an emergency descent. Yes. <clears throat> Shall we use our mask too? We better. I think we better use the oxygen mask. Yes. But they don't put on their masks. No one knows why. 
It might be indecision or hypoxia beginning to cloud their judgment. At Japan Airlines in Tokyo, flight operations have been alerted to the emergency, but are as mystified as everyone else on the ground. All they know is that over 500 lives are at stake. It's their job to try to diagnose the problem and come up with a solution while the plane is in the air. This is Japan Air Tokyo. Tokyo Control said they received an emergency call from you. And Listen, right now the R5 door has broken. Uh, Roger, is the captain returning to Tokyo? What? Can you return to Haneda? Uh, uh, just a moment, uh, we are making an emergency descent. Uh, we'll contact you again in a little while. Uh, keep monitoring us, please. Uh, Roger. R5 door. Could it have come off? If the door has come off, that could mean an explosive decompression of the cabin as the air rushes out. Passengers may have been sucked out kilometers above the ground. But there's a worse possibility. If the door hit the tail of the aircraft, it could have damaged it. The tail keeps the plane stable. Its rudder and elevators make the plane go up and down or side to side. If the tail is damaged, flight operations will be powerless to assist them. In Tokyo, news that a Japan Airlines jumbo jet is in trouble has leaked almost immediately. Japanese television is already breaking into regular programming with live interviews. Someone saw the crippled jet fly overhead. I knew the plane was in trouble, he is saying. It was swaying back and forth. Then it disappeared in a cloud. Flight 123's meandering route has put it in range of an American Air Force base at Yokota on the northern outskirts of Tokyo. An American controller there has overheard the conversations between the plane and Tokyo Air Traffic Control. He wants to help to offer Yokota runway for landing. Japan Air 123, Japan Air 123, Yokota approach. If you hear me, contact Yokota. Pilots are preoccupied and don't respond. Since they've lost all normal control of the plane, they're now testing the throttles to see what happens. They can make the plane go faster or slower. At least they have speed at their command. As they experiment, they find that if they push the throttles forward when the plane is diving, making the engines go faster, it actually makes the plane come out of the dive and brings the nose up. And if they pull back the throttles when it's climbing, slowing the engines, the nose tips and begins to dive. These actions are the opposite of what a pilot would normally do, but it seems to work, and they begin to flatten out the mad roller coaster ride. Then a second experiment. By applying more thrust to the engines on the left side of the aircraft, they manage to slowly turn the plane right in the general direction of Tokyo. Then their luck runs out. In the frantic juggling of throttles, the pilots get out of step. It drives the 747 into a frenzy. Both hands. How about gear down? Gear down! Should put the gear down. Lowering the landing gear should slow the plane down and make it more stable. Doesn't work. Should I lower the alternate? For safety, 747s employ an electrically run system, separate from the hydraulics, that can lower the landing gear in an emergency. While the engines are turning, they still have electric power. Lowering the landing gear helps stabilize the plane. The drag of the undercarriage has a dampening effect on the pitching motion. But it also destroys the directional control they were getting by applying more power to one side of the aircraft. Max power. Close to Mount Fuji, the tallest mountain in Japan, the plane makes an abrupt turn to the right and begins a terrifying dive. The plane is falling at 900 meters a minute, twice the normal rate of descent. We're going down. Heavy. Took the wheel all the way. All the way. It's all the way. Heavy. Get the gear down. Gears down! There is no need for alarm! The, the plane's black box records the flight attendant still trying to calm the passengers. Japan Air, one, two, three. 
Control. He's gonna hit the mountain. All station, all station except the Japan Air 123. Keep silent until further advised. Uncontrollable. Understood. Do you wish to contact? Stay with us, please. Stay with us. Just as suddenly the plane comes out of its dive, they've dropped over 3,000 meters. They're now in amongst towering mountains, but at least there's more oxygen at this altitude. The pilots have been fighting the plane for an intense 22 minutes since the explosion. This may be hopeless. The hydraulic fluid is all gone. It's uncontrollable. Terrain. Hey, mountain, come! The rain, yes! Terrain. Rain, rain, rain! I got it! We're gonna hit the mountain! Back far! Applying maximum power in order to lift the nose is their only option. We're gonna hit it! Red! 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 Power! Power! Keep trying! In their efforts to control the plane, they've allowed the speed to drop too much. To escape the mountain, they need maximum power to generate more speed and more lift. Stick with it! Stick with it! The passengers grasp the seriousness of the situation. Many of them prepare for the end. But increasing power to avoid the mountains has caused the plane to resume its wayward up and down motions. Having run out of options, the crew is forced to repeat the same futile procedures over and over. They've been fighting the plane for nearly 30 minutes now. Japan Air 123, Japan Air 123, Yokota. The air traffic controllers, Japanese and American, are desperate to help, to give Flight 123 any information or reassurance they can. Request a radar vector to Haneda. Roger, understood. Keep heading 090. Zero, but frustratingly, the plane continues heading off to the northwest, away from both Haneda Airport and Yokota Air Base. Now, with every rise and fall of the plane, they're barely above the mountaintops. Can you control the aircraft now? An ominous silence descends on area control. Japan Air 123, switch your radio frequency to 119.7. 119.7, please. They try changing radio frequency. If you can, change the frequency to 119.7. There is no reply. If you read, come up on 119.7, we are all ready. Your position, five, uh, four or five miles northwest of Haneda. In the tensions of the moment, the controller is a bit confused and mistakes the plane's distance from Haneda. Northwest of Haneda? How many miles? Yes, that is correct. On our radar, you are 55, five, five miles northwest. We are ready for your approach at any time. Yokota is also available for landing. Let us know your intentions. Over. At Haneda Airport, emergency services are being mobilized for the plane, wherever it can touch down. Yes, watch oh, ah. They say we're 25 miles west of Kumagaya. Suddenly, the plane goes into a steep dive, the worst yet. Stop the flap! Ah. Power! Flap up! Flap up! Flap up! Power! The plane is falling at 5,500 meters a minute.
Japan Air 123. Japan Air 123. Can you hear me? Japan Air 123. Japan Air 123. Do you read? Japan Air 123. Japan Air 123. Japan Air 123 is gone. At Tokyo Control, they've lost contact with a Japan Airlines jumbo jet full of passengers. An American plane flying in the area has been listening in to the drama of Flight 123 and reports seeing flames in the mountains some hundred kilometers west of Tokyo. One of the C-130 pilots later said that they even guided a rescue helicopter to the scene and American Marines stood by, ready to rappel down to the burning wreckage. But before they could do so, they were ordered to return to base. Rivalry between the various Japanese emergency forces is reported to have caused confusion and delays as the victims of the crash wait for help. During the night, the Japanese self-defense force arrives on the scene. A helicopter flown by Captain Isuzu Omori finds the crash site. The pilot radios in. Minokayama, Victor 107. I see something. I see flames in about 10 spots over an area of about 300 meters square. Victor 107, Minokayama, is there any sign of survivors? Victor 107, no signs of survivors. Visibility poor, too much smoke. Victor 107, can you land to investigate? Not a chance. It's a 45 degree slope down there. Nowhere to put down. And there's fire everywhere. Seeing no sign of survivors and unwilling to risk a landing at night, Captain Omori returns to base. Meanwhile, a team of rescuers is on its way by road. But since they don't expect to find anyone alive, they spend the night in a village 68 kilometers from the crash site. At the crash site, the passengers of Flight 123 lie dying. The next morning, the last moments of Flight 123 start to become clear. The 747 sliced a path through the trees near the top of Mount Osutaka, one of the mountains north of Mount Fuji. The plane finally hit a ridge several hundred meters further on and exploded. The wreckage and passengers then tumbled down the steep side of the mountain. It's now 14 hours after the crash, and the Japanese Self-Defense Force rescue team arrives at the scene. They are confronted with the worst single aircraft accident in history. find a survivor. It's the off-duty flight attendant, Yumi Ochiai, still hanging on to life. And she is not the only one. Rescuers find a 12-year-old girl wedged in the branches of a tree and airlift her to safety. Incredibly, two more passengers are alive, a young mother and her eight-year-old daughter. It's nothing short of a miracle. 
but how have these four survived? The human body is believed to be able to stand a forward deceleration of up to 25 times the force of gravity. But investigators report that from the speed at which the aircraft hit the ground, those at the front of the plane experienced a sudden stop of over 100 Gs. The four survivors are hurried to a hospital in Fujioka City. Investigators will soon discover that all four of the surviving passengers were seated in the last seven rows. This is how they survived. In the back of the 747, the impact forces were much less. Sheer luck had protected them from the flying debris. Yumi Ochiai has a broken pelvis and a fractured arm. She tells a disturbing story of what happened as she lay on the mountain, awaiting rescue, and that many more passengers survived the crash. After the crash, I heard harsh panting and gasping noises from many people. I heard it coming from everywhere, all around me. There was a boy crying, Mother. I clearly heard a young woman saying, Come quickly. Suddenly, I heard a boy's voice. OK, I'll hang on, he said. It sounded like the voice of a boy of about school age. In the darkness, I could hear the sound of a helicopter. I couldn't see any light, but I could hear the sound, and it was quite near too. We'll be saved, I thought, and waved frantically. But the helicopter went further away. Don't go, I waved desperately. Help, but it faded. I could no longer hear the voices of the boy or the young woman. It's clear now that many died in the cold night air, waiting for rescue. The crash of this jumbo jet would normally be a strictly Japanese affair, but it sets aviation alarm bells ringing around the world. Only weeks earlier, an Air India 747 had gone down in the Atlantic, killing 329 people. Now another 520 dead. Was there something wrong with the 747, the world's biggest jet? Could there be some unknown design fault? There were some 600 747s flying worldwide. A problem with the plane would have grave consequences for aviation. Ron Schleed, a top investigator with America's National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB, was assigned the case. So it was very big concern on our part uh, about whether there was a problem with the 747, an airworthiness problem. And so we had to jump on this uh, very quickly to learn what happened. At the Washington headquarters of the NTSB, the chairman was extremely concerned of the potential consequences for world aviation. He wrote a personal note to his opposite number in Japan, begging him to invite the NTSB to join the investigation as guests. During the late 70s and 80s, Ron Schleed was involved with many of the major foreign investigations for the NTSB. He's familiar with the sensitivities of working with foreign governments and heads to Tokyo, where he'll meet the rest of his team, representatives from Boeing, the plane's manufacturer, and an engineer from America's Federal Aviation Administration. When I arrived in Tokyo, the atmosphere in Japan was uh, extremely stressful. The news media were everywhere. There was a tremendous amount of anger. Once in Japan, Schleed found that the local Japanese police had taken over the investigation and were treating it like a crime scene, diligently observing his team's every move. Everyone was, was considered suspicious. Japanese airline personnel, Boeing personnel, were considered suspicious. They weren't even allowed to go to the accident site. Schleed had to wait for two days before the Japanese authorities would allow him to visit the site. I was able to convince the Japanese to allow us to take Boeing people to the site with the stipulation that the Boeing people stick, stuck very close to us and uh, we supervised them while they were on scene. They could not operate on their own. 
Schleid found that to gain access to the site, the Japanese had quickly constructed helicopter landing pads. It was an amazing sight to look up at this mountain and see what looked like wreckage from an airplane at a distance, but you could not recognize any part of an airplane. There were scores of helicopters in the air landing and taking off every couple minutes. Amidst the wreckage of JAL-123, Schleid found that some families of the victims had managed to scramble to the remote mountain site on foot and build shrines to their loved ones. From above, flowers rained down on the investigators. I recall these big white, I believe they were Chinook helicopters, flying over, and uh, there were families aboard the helicopters looking at the accident site. They were quite high, and they were dropping flower, flower petals down onto the accident site. The one thing that we found uh, when we got to the accident site was that many of the passengers had a lot of time to think about the end. And uh, they found many, many notes written on pieces of paper, anything they could get their hands on. My darling wife, life with you has been wonderful. Our children have grown up to be people I am proud of. I never dreamed that the dinner we had last night would be our last together. Passengers were able to think and realize that they were out of control and maybe going to crash, so they wrote notes to their loved ones and left them in the back of the seats or in their pockets. But what could have caused this disaster? Neither the heart-rending letters nor the tangled wreckage yet yield any answer to what happened to Flight 123. Still, the main thing the investigators have to go on are the words on the plane's cockpit voice recorder, those of the plane's flight engineer who had said that door R5 was broken. They believe that the door has somehow come off in flight, crashed into the tail, and damaged the plane's flying surfaces. The horizontal stabilizer, which makes the plane go up and down, the rudder, which controls side-to-side -side movement. But then, a piece of news that destroys that theory totally. The door had not come off. It's found by the investigators amidst the wreckage. The flight engineer was wrong. Ah, uh, right now the R5 door has broken! The warning light on his panel led him to believe that the door had failed in flight. But the alarm may well have been set off by a short circuit in the electrical system, caused by the ceiling collapsing in the explosion. It was not a broken door that caused Flight 123 to crash. The investigators would have to look elsewhere. Stop the flap! Power! 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 Flap up! Flap up! Flap up! Flap up! It's up! Japan Airlines Flight 123 has crashed into Mount Osutaka, taking hundreds of lives. Investigators are worried about a hidden fault in the Boeing 747. They need to find the cause of this crash quickly. A photograph taken by an amateur photographer provides the first clue to the mystery of why the plane became unflyable. There's something odd about the image. Photographic technicians put it on a computer and work hard to enhance the photograph to sharpen up its blurred lines. Finally, they get a clear enough picture. The whole huge tail fin of the airplane is missing. It's what keeps the plane steady. Since most of the plane's hydraulic fluid lines pass through the fin, it starts to make sense why they lost hydraulic pressure and control of the plane. 
Then, a Japanese Navy ship steaming across the bay south of Tokyo came upon the plane's tail fin floating on the sea. It's at the very spot where the plane had first reported an emergency. Investigators are now certain that the starting point of the accident must have something to do with the tail of the aircraft. They review the known facts. Something had caused the ceiling at the back of the plane to collapse. There had been an explosive decompression of the aircraft. Whatever it was also ripped off the tail fin and the main hydraulic lines with it, making the plane uncontrollable. This may be hopeless. The hydraulic fluid is all gone. At last. Explosion, decompression, loss of the tail fin and hydraulic failure. The investigators need to find out what links these four elements together. Routinely, the investigators begin by looking back into the plane's history. And they make an intriguing discovery. The plane had been in another accident seven years earlier. The pilot landed the plane with its nose too high. The tail struck the ground and scraped along the runway. There had been a repair to the rear part of the airplane, including the rear pressure bulkhead. Well, all modern jets, uh, aircraft, when they climb, they have to be pressurized to keep the cabin to a reasonable level for the passengers. So let's take a 747. When the 747 is on the ground, it's actually somewhat oval-shaped. And as it climbs and pressurizes, it becomes more circular. The rear pressure bulkhead is like a huge metal umbrella lying on its side at the very back of the plane. Its purpose is to stop pressurized air escaping from the cabin out through the tail of the aircraft. It must be very, very heavy and strong because the forces are tremendous. They're over eight uh, PSI differential, very a lot of pressure. The design of uh, 747 aft pressure bulkhead was what they call a dome. And uh, it was uh, uh, designed to take the pressure with a lot less heavy metal. And it's a, it's a typical design. It's a pressure dome. Seven years earlier, Japan Airlines called in Boeing to repair the cracked bulkhead. Boeing engineers spliced a new panel into the damaged bulkhead. But at the accident site of Flight 123 in 1985, Ron Schleed stumbled across a piece of wreckage that unraveled the whole mystery. It was a piece of this new panel that had been spliced into the bulkhead. The repair had, in fact, not been done correctly. There was only one row of rivets holding that joint together, uh, where there should have been uh, two rows of rivets holding the joint together. To explain to the Japanese investigators what he discovered, Ron Schleed sketched out how the repair should have been made and the mistake that had been made. It was a catastrophic error. The rivets were carrying twice the force they should have been. One of the FA engineers there did some calculations for us based on this earlier repair of the bulkhead. And his theory was if the repair wasn't done correctly, for example, if they had not put the rivets in properly and they only had one row of rivets holding the bulkhead together versus two as designed, that it possibly could, it would fail prematurely. The FAA engineer calculated that the faulty repair to the bulkhead would fail after 10,000 flights. From the moment the repair was done, it was simply a matter of time. The investigators found that a simple human error had led to this. On a summer's evening in 1985, Japan Air 123 lifts off from Haneda Airport. It's the 12,319th takeoff since the repair of the damaged bulkhead a repair that the investigators calculated would only hold for 10,000 flights. 
As the plane climbs to 7,300 meters, the air outside gets thinner and thinner. But the air inside the cabin is pressurized for the passenger's comfort. The difference of pressure between the passenger cabin on one side of the bulkhead and the unpressurized tail on the other stretches the bulkhead and its faulty repair to the breaking point. In a test which duplicated these conditions, cracks began to appear and lengthen around the rivet holes until the bulkhead snaps. In an instant, pressurized air from the cabin blows a hole in it two to three meters square, bringing down the ceiling around the rear toilets. The highly pressurized air blasts its way into the tail fin of the aircraft and simply blows it off. From that moment on, the plane is doomed. The pilots don't know, and will never know, that most of the tail of their aircraft is missing, blown off into the sea below along with the crucial hydraulic lines that allow them to control the plane. It all finally makes sense. Without the stabilizing influence of the tail, and with the loss of ability to control the rudder and flaps, the pilots cannot control the plane. The giant aircraft now oscillates in a terrifying motion called the fugoid cycle. As the nose drops into a shallow dive, the plane gathers speed, which generates lift. The nose rises again, and the plane begins to climb until it loses speed, tips over, and begins to fall again. The whole cycle repeats itself over and over again. Flight 123 is now plunging up and down in terrifying dives, sometimes several hundred meters at a time. It really could be considered a miracle that the pilots were able to keep the airplane flying for 30 minutes or more after having lost all the hydraulics in their flight controls. But it kept circling and eventually worked its way into the mountains, and it became impossible for them to uh, to land. There was no real alternative for them at all, uh, except to fly as long as they could and hope for some miracle, which never occurred. Lower the nose. Lower the nose. Yes. Both hands. How about gear down? Gear down. To put the gear down. To understand what the pilots were up against, four hand-picked flight crews were placed in a simulator and confronted with the same situation. Not one of them could land the plane. The pilots of Flight 123 managed to keep their plane in the air for 30 minutes, much of it among high mountains, an amazing feat of flying. Back in Tokyo, as the cause of the JAL accident was identified, Ron Schlied had to break the news to his colleague from Boeing, one of the top designers of the 747. The simple truth was that a single row of rivets had been used when a double row was required. And when we uh, described our findings to him, you can imagine this Boeing man became very, very upset. Uh, uh, personally, uh, was crying because of the fact that his airplane that he designed and then the people that did the repair, because it was Boeing people that designed and did the repair, had made an improper repair that caused the airplane to crash. The Japanese police wanted to bring criminal charges against Boeing for its part in the tragedy but the prosecutors decided not to go ahead. Boeing's reputation was damaged, but if they could derive any comfort at all from this tragedy, it was that there was no inherent fault in the 747. The plane continues on to become one of the most successful civil aircraft of all time. However, Japan Airlines, the innocent party, had no such comfort. After I left uh, the scene, and came home, it was my understanding that one of the senior Japanese Airlines uh, uh, maintenance managers actually committed suicide. The Japanese Airlines president resigned. The bookings slumped. Rumors abounded in Japan that the airline was indeed guilty and that Boeing was just taking the rap for a valuable customer. It's taken years for Japan Airlines to recover from this experience the worst single plane crash in history.